Jonathan Livingston Siegel A Story by Richard Bach Part 1 It was morning, and the new sun sparkled gold across the ripples of a gentle sea. A mile from shore, a fishing boat chummed the water, and the word for breakfast flock flashed through the air, till a crowd of a thousand seagulls came to dodge and fight for bits of food. It was another busy day beginning. The way off alone, out by himself beyond boat and shore, Jonathan Livingston Seagull was practicing. A hundred feet in the sky, he lowered his webbed feet, lifted his beak, and strained to hold a painful, hard, twisting curve through his wings. The curve meant that he would fly slowly, and now he slowed until the wind was a whisper in his face, until the ocean stood still beneath him. He narrowed his eyes in fierce concentration, held his breath, forced one single more inch of curve. Then his feathers ruffled. He stalled and fell. Seagulls, as you know, never falter, never stall. To stall in the air is for them disgrace, and it is dishonor. But Jonathan Livingston Seagull, unashamed, stretching his wings again in that trembling hard curve, slowing, slowing, and stalling once more, was no ordinary bird. Most gulls don't bother to learn more than the simplest facts of flight, how to get from shore to food and back again. For most gulls, it is not flying that matters, but eating. For this gull, though, it was not eating that mattered, but flight. More than anything else, Jonathan Livingston Seagull loved to fly. This kind of thinking, he found, is not the way to make oneself popular with other birds. Even his parents were dismayed as Jonathan spent whole days alone, making hundreds of low-level glides experimenting. He didn't know why, for instance, but when he flew at altitudes less than half his wingspan above water, he could stay in the air longer with less effort. His glides ended not with the usual feet down splash into the sea, but with a long, flat wake as he touched the surface, with his feet tightly streamlined against his body. When he began sliding in to feed up landings on the beach, then pacing the length of his slide in the sand, his parents were very much dismayed indeed. Why, John, why? his mother asked. Why is it so hard to be like the rest of the flock, John? Why can't you leave low flying to the pelicans, the albatross? Why don't you eat? Son, you're bone and feathers. I don't mind being bone and feathers, Mom. I just want to know what I can do in the air and what I can't. That's all. I just want to know. See here, Jonathan, said his father, not unkindly. Winter isn't far away. Boats will be few, and the surface fish will be swimming deep. If you must study, then study food and how to get it. This flying business is all very well, but you can't eat a glide, you know. Don't you forget the reason you fly is to eat. Jonathan nodded obediently. For the next few days, he tried to behave like the other gulls. He really tried, screeching and fighting with the flock around the piers and fishing boats, diving on scraps of fish and bread. But he couldn't make it work. It's all so pointless, he thought, deliberately dropping a hard-won anchovy to a hungry old gull chasing him. If I could spend all my time learning to fly, there's so much to learn. It wasn't long before Jonathan Gull was off by himself again, far out at sea, hungry, happy, learning. The subject was speed, and in a week's practice he learned more about speed than the fastest gull alive. From a thousand feet, flapping his wings as hard as he could, he pushed over a blazing steep dive towards the waves, and learned why seagulls don't make blazing steep power dives. In just six seconds, he was moving seventy miles per hour, the speed at which one's wings go unstable on the upstroke. Time after time it happened. Careful as he was, working at the very peak of his ability, he lost control at high speed. Climbed to a thousand feet, full power straight ahead, first, then push over, flapping to a vertical dive. Then every time his left wing stalled on an upstroke, he'd roll violently left, stall his right wing recovering, and flick like fire into a wild, tumbling spin to the right. He couldn't be careful enough on that upstroke. Ten times he tried, and all ten times, as he passed through seventy miles per hour, he burst into a churning mass of feathers out of control, crashing down into the water. The key he thought at last, dripping wet, must be to hold the wings still at high speeds. To flap up to fifty and then hold the wings still. From two thousand feet he tried again, 
rolling into his dive, beak straight down, wings full out, and stable from the moment he passed 50 miles per hour. It took tremendous strength, but it worked. In 10 seconds, he had blurred through 90 miles per hour. Jonathan had set a world speed record for seagulls. But victory was short-lived. The instant he began his pullout, the instant he changed the angle of his wings, he snapped into that same terrible uncontrolled disaster, and at 90 miles per hour it hit him like dynamite. Jonathan Seagull exploded in midair and smashed down into a brick-hard sea. When he came to, it was well after dark, and he floated in moonlight on the surface of the ocean. His wings were ragged bars of lead, but the weight of failure was even heavier on his back. He wished feebly that the weight could be just enough to drag him gently down to the bottom and end it all. As he sank low in the water, a strange hollow voice sounded within him. There's no way around it. I am a seagull. I'm limited by my nature. If I were meant to learn so much about flying, I'd have charts for brains. If I were meant to fly at speed, I'd have a falcon's short wings and live on mice instead of fish. My father was right. I must forget this foolishness. I must fly home to the flock and be content as I am. A poor, limited seagull. The voice faded and Jonathan agreed. The place for a seagull at night is on shore, and from this moment forth he vowed he would be a normal gull. It would make everyone happier. He pushed warily away from the dark water and flew toward the land, grateful for what he had learned about work-saving low-altitude flying. But no, he thought. I am done with the way I was. I am done with everything I learned. I am a seagull like every other seagull, and I will fly like one. So he climbed painfully to a hundred feet and flapped his wings harder, pressing for shore. He felt better for his decision to be just another one of the flock. There would be no ties now to the force that had driven him to learn, and there would be no more challenge and no more failure. And it was pretty, just to stop thinking and fly through the dark towards the lights above the beach. Dark! The hollow voice cracked in alarm. Seagulls never fly in the dark. Jonathan was not alert to listen. It's pretty, he thought. The moon and the lights twinkling on the water, throwing out little beacon trails through the night, and all so peaceful and still. Get down! Seagulls never fly in the dark. If you were meant to fly in the dark, you'd have the eyes of an owl. You'd have charts for brains. You'd have a falcon short wings. There in the night, a hundred feet in the air, Jonathan Livingston Seagull blinked. His pain... His resolutions vanished. Short wings. A falcon short wings. That's the answer. What a fool I've been. All I need is a tiny little wing. All I need is to fold most of my wings and fly on just the tips alone. Short wings. He climbed 2,000 feet above the Black Sea, and without a moment for thought of failure and death, he brought his four wings tightly into his body, left only the narrow swept daggers of his wingtips extended into the wind, and fell into a vertical dive. The wind was a monster roar at his head. Seventy miles per hour, ninety, a hundred and twenty, and faster still. The wing strain, now at a hundred and forty miles per hour, wasn't nearly as hard as it had been at seventy. And with the faintest twist of his wingtips, he eased out of the dive and shot above the waves, a gray cannonball under the moon. He closed his eyes to the slits against the wind and rejoiced. A hundred forty miles per hour, and under control. If I dive from 5,000 feet instead of 2,000, I wonder how fast. His vows of a moment before were forgotten, swept away in that great swift wind. Yet he felt guiltless, breaking the promises he had made himself. Such promises are only for the goals that accept the ordinary. One who has touched excellence in his learning has no need of that kind of promise. By sunup, Jonathan Gull was practicing again. From 5,000 feet, the fishing boats were specks in the flat blue water. Breakfast flock was a faint cloud of dust motes, circling. He was alive, trembling ever so slightly with delight, proud that his fear was under control. Then without ceremony, he hugged in his forewings, extended his short angled wingtips, and plunged directly toward the sea. By the time he passed 4,000 feet, he had reached terminal velocity. The wind was a solid beating wall of sound, against which he could move no faster. He was flying now straight down at 214 miles per hour. He swallowed, knowing that if his wings unfolded to that speed, he'd be blown into a million tiny shreds of seagull. But the speed was power, and the speed was joy, 
and the speed was pure beauty. He began his pullout at a thousand feet, wingtips thudding and blurring in that gigantic wind, the boat and the crowd of gulls tilting and growing meteor fast, directly in his path. He couldn't stop. He didn't know yet even how to turn at that speed. Collision would be instant, and so he shut his eyes. It happened that morning, then, just after sunrise, that Jonathan Livingston Seagull fired directly through the center of breakfast flock, taking off 212 miles per hour, eyes closed in a great roaring shriek of wind and feathers. The gull of fortune smiled upon him this once, and no one was killed. By the time he had pulled his beak straight up into the sky, he was still scorching along at 160 miles per hour. When he had slowed to 20 and stretched his wings again at last, the boat was a crumb on the sea, 4,000 feet below. His thought was triumph. Terminal velocity. A seagull at 214 miles per hour. It was a breakthrough. The greatest single moment in the history of the flock. And in that moment, a new age opened for Jonathan Gull. Flying out to his lonely practice area, folding his wings for a dive from 8,000 feet, he set himself at once to discover how to turn. A single wingtip feather, he found, moved a fraction of an inch, gives a smooth, sweeping curve at tremendous speed. Before he learned this, however, he found that moving more than one feather at that speed will spin you like a rifle ball, and Jonathan had flown the very first aerobatics of any seagull on earth. He spared no time that day for talk with other gulls, but flew on past sunset. He discovered the loop, the slow roll, the point roll, the inverted spin, the gull bunt, the pinwheel. When Jonathan Seagull joined the flock on the beach, it was a full night. He was dizzy and terribly tired. Yet, in delight, he flew a loop to landing with a snap roll just before touchdown. When they hear of it, he thought, of the breakthrough, they'll be wild with joy. How much more there is down to living, instead of our drab slogging back and forth and back and forth to the fishing boats, there's a reason to life. We can lift ourselves out of ignorance. We can find ourselves as creatures of excellence and intelligence and skill. We can be free. We can learn to fly. The years ahead hummed and glowed with promise. The gulls were flocked into the council gathering when he landed, and apparently had been so flocked for some time. They were, in fact, waiting. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, stand to center. The elder's words sounded in a voice of highest ceremony. Stand to center meant only great shame or great honor. Stand to center for honor was the way the gull's foremost leaders were marked. Of course, he thought, the breakfast flock this morning, they saw the breakthrough. But I want no honors. I have no wish to be leader. I only want to share what I've found, to show those horizons out ahead for all of us. He stepped forward. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, said the elder, stand to center for shame in the sight of your fellow girls. It felt like being hit with a board. His knees went weak, his feathers sagged, and there was roaring in his ears. Centered for shame? Impossible. The breakthrough. They can't understand. They're wrong. They're wrong. For his reckless irresponsibility, the solemn voice intoned, violating the dignity and tradition of the Gull family. To be centered for shame meant that he would be cast out of Gull society, banished to a solitary life on the far cliffs. One day, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, you shall learn that irresponsibility does not pay. Life is the unknown and the unknowable, except that we are put into this world to eat, to stay alive as long as we possibly can. A seagull never speaks back to the council flock, but it was Jonathan's voice raised. Irresponsibility? My brothers, he cried. Who is more responsible than a gull who finds and follows a meaning, a higher purpose for life? For a thousand years we have scrabbled after fish heads, but now we have a reason to live, to learn, to discover, to be free. Give me one chance. Let me show you what I found. The flock might as well have been stone. The brotherhood is broken, the gulls intoned together. And with one accord, they solemnly closed their ears and turned their backs upon him. Jonathan Seagull spent the rest of his days alone, but he flew way out beyond the far cliffs. His one sorrow was not solitude, 
It was that the other gulls refused to believe the glory of flight that awaited them. They refused to open their eyes and see. He learned more each day. He learned that a streamlined high-speed dive could bring him to find the rare and tasty fish that schooled ten feet below the surface of the ocean. He no longer needed fishing boats and stale bread for survival. He learned to sleep in the air, setting a course at night across the offshore wind, covering a hundred miles from sunset to sunrise with the same inner control. He flew through heavy sea fogs and climbed above them into dazzling clear skies. In the very times when every other gull stood on the ground knowing nothing but mist and rain, he learned to ride the high winds far inland to dine there on delicate insects. What he had once hoped for the flock, he now gained for himself alone. He learned to fly and was not sorry for the price that he had paid. Jonathan Seagull discovered that boredom and fear and anger are the reasons that a gull's life is so short, and with these gone from his thought, he lived a long, fine life indeed. They came in the evening, then, and found Jonathan gliding peaceful and alone through his beloved sky. The two gulls that appeared at his wings were pure as starlight, and the glow from them was gentle and friendly in the high night air. But most lovely of all was the skill with which they flew, their wingtips moving a precise and constant inch from his own. Without a word, Jonathan put them to his test, a test that no gull had ever passed. He twisted his wings, slowed to a single mile per hour above stall. The two radiant birds slowed with him, smoothly locked in position. They knew about slow flying. He folded his wings, rolled, and dropped in a dive to 190 miles per hour. They dropped with him, streaking down in flawless formation. At last, he turned that speed straight up into a long, vertical, slow roll. They rolled with him, smiling. He recovered to level flight and was quiet for a time before he spoke. Very well, he said. Who are you? We're from your flock, Jonathan. We are your brothers. Their words were strong and calm. We've come to take you higher, to take you home. Home I have none. Flock I have none. I am outcast. And we fly now at the peak of the great mountain wind. Beyond a few hundred feet, I can lift this old body no higher. But you can, Jonathan, for you have learned. One school is finished, and the time has come for another to begin. As it had shined across him all his life, so understanding lighted that moment for Jonathan Siegel. They were right. He could fly higher, and it was time to go home. He gave one last long look across the sky, across that magnificent silver land where he had learned so much. I'm ready, he said at last, and Jonathan Livingston Siegel rose with the two star-bright gulls to disappear into a perfect dark sky. So this is heaven, he thought, and he had to smile at himself. It was hardly respectful to analyze heaven in the very moment that one flies up to enter it. As he came from earth now, above the clouds and in close formation with the two brilliant gulls, he saw that his own body was growing as bright as theirs. True, the same young Jonathan Seagull was there that had always lived behind his golden eyes, but the outer form had changed. It felt like a seagull body. But already, it flew far better than his old one ever had flown. Why, with half the effort, he thought, I'll get twice the speed, twice the performance of my best days on Earth. His feathers glowed brilliant white now, and his wings were smooth and perfect as sheets of polished silver. He began, delightedly, to learn about them, to press power into these new wings. At 250 miles per hour, he felt that he was nearing his level flight maximum speed. At 273, he thought that he was flying as fast as he could fly, and he was ever so faintly disappointed. There was a limit to how much the new body could do. And though it was much faster than his old flight level record, it was still a limit that would take great effort to crack. In heaven, he thought, there should be no limits. The clouds broke apart. His escorts called, Happy landings, Jonathan, and vanished into thin air. He was flying over a sea toward a jagged shoreline. A very few seagulls were working the updrafts on the cliffs. Away off to the north, at the horizon itself, flew a few others. New sights, new thoughts, new questions. Why so few gulls? Heaven should be flocked with gulls, and why am I so tired all at once? Gulls in heaven are never supposed to be tired or to sleep. Where had he heard that? The memory of his life on earth was falling away. Earth had been a place where he had learned much, of course, but the details were blurred. Something about fighting for food and being outcast. The dozen gulls by the shoreline came to meet him, 
none saying a word. He felt only that he was welcome and that this was home. It had been a big day for him, a day whose sunrise he no longer remembered. He turned to land on the beach, beating his wings to stop an inch in the air, then dropping lightly to the sand. The other gulls landed too, but not one of them so much as flapped a feather. They swung into the wind, bright wings outstretched. Then somehow they changed the curve of their feathers until they had stopped in the same instant their feet touched the ground. It was beautiful control, but now Jonathan was just too tired to try it. Standing there on the beach, still without a word spoken, he was asleep. In the days that followed, Jonathan saw that there was as much to learn about flight in this place as there had been in the life behind him, but with a difference. Here were gulls who thought as he thought. For each of them, the most important thing in living was to reach out and touch perfection in what they most loved to do, and that was to fly. They were magnificent birds, all of them, and they spent hour after hour every day practicing flight, testing advanced aeronautics. For a long time, Jonathan forgot about the world that he had come from, that place where the flock lived with its eyes tightly shut to the joy of flight, using its wings as a mean to the end of finding and fighting for food. But now and then, just for a moment, he remembered. He remembered it one morning when he was out with his instructor while they rested on the beach after a session of folded wing snap rolls. Where is everybody, Sullivan? he asked silently, quite at home now with the easy telepathy that these gulls used instead of screes and grecks. Why aren't there more of us here? Why, where I come from, there were thousands and thousands of gulls. I know. Sullivan shook his head. The only answer I can see, Jonathan, is that you are pretty well a one-in-a-million bird. Most of us came along ever so slowly. We went from one world into another that was almost exactly like it, forgetting right away where we had come from, not caring where we were headed, living for the moment. Do you have any idea how many lives we must have gone through before we even got the first idea that there is more than life to eating, or fighting, or power in the flock? A thousand lives, John. Ten thousand. And then another hundred lives until we began to learn that there is another hundred lives until we begin to learn that there is such a thing as perfection. And another hundred again to get the idea that our purpose for living is to find that perfection and show it forth. The same rule holds for us now, of course. We choose our next world through what we learn in this one learn nothing, and the next world is the same as this one, all the same limitations and lead weights to overcome. He stretched his wings and turned to face the wind. But you, John, he said, learned so much at one time that you didn't have to go through a thousand lives to reach this one. In a moment they were airborne again, practicing. The formation point rolls were difficult, for though inverted half Jonathan had to think upside down, reversing the curve of his wings and reversing it exactly in harmony with his instructors. Let's try again, Sullivan said, over and over. Let's try it again. Then finally, good. And they began practicing outside loops. One evening the goals that were not night flying stood together on the sand, thinking. Jonathan took all his courage in hand and walked to the elder gull, who, it was said, was soon to be moving beyond this world. Chang, he said, a little nervously. The old seagull looked at him kindly. Yes, my son. Instead of being enfeebled by age, the elder had been empowered by it. He could outfly any gull in the flock, and he had learned skills that the others were only gradually coming to know. Chiang, this world doesn't have it at all, is it? The elder smiled in the moonlight. You are learning again, Jonathan Siegel, he said. Well, what happens from here? Where are we going? Is there no such place as heaven? No, Jonathan, there is no such place. Heaven is not a place, and it is not a time. Heaven is perfect being. He was silent for a moment. You are a very fast flyer, aren't you? I, I enjoy speed, Jonathan said, taken aback, but proud that the elder had noticed. You will begin to touch heaven, Jonathan, in the moment that you touch perfect speed. And that isn't flying a thousand miles an hour, or a million, or flying at the speed of light, because any number is a limit, and perfection doesn't have limits. Perfect speed, my son is being there. Without warning, Chang vanished, and appeared at the water's edge fifty feet away, all in the flicker of an instant. Then he vanished again and stood in the same millisecond at Jonathan's shoulder. It was kind of fun, he said. Jonathan was dazzled. He forgot to ask about heaven. How do you do that? What does it feel like? How far can you go? You can go to any place and to any time that you wish to go, the elder said. I've gone everywhere, in every wind I can think of. He looked across the sea. It's strange, 
The girls who scorn perfection for the sake of travel go nowhere, slowly. Those who put aside travel for the sake of perfection go anywhere, instantly. Remember, Jonathan, heaven isn't a place or a time, because place and time are so very meaningless. Heaven is... Can you teach me to fly like that? Jonathan Seagull trembled to conquer another unknown. Of course, if you wish to learn. I wish. When can we start? We could start now, if you like. I want to learn to fly like that, Jonathan said, and a strange light glowed in his eyes. Tell me what to do. Chiang spoke slowly and watched the younger gull ever so carefully. To fly as fast as thought, to anywhere that is, he said, you must begin by knowing that you have already arrived. The trick, according to Chiang, was for Jonathan to stop seeing himself as trapped inside a limited body that had a 42-inch wingspan and performance that could be plotted on a chart. The trick was to know that his true nature lived as perfect as an unwritten number, everywhere at once, across space and time. Jonathan kept at it fiercely, day after day, from before sunrise till past midnight, and for all his effort, he moved not a feather width from his spot. Forget about faith, Chiang said it time and again. You didn't need faith to fly, you needed to understand flying. This is just the same, now try again. Then one day, Jonathan, standing on the shore, closing his eyes, concentrating, all in a flash, knew what Chiang had been telling him. Why, that's true. I am a perfect unlimited gull. He felt a great shock of joy. Good, said Chiang, and there was victory in his voice. Jonathan opened his eyes. He stood alone with the elder on a totally different seashore, trees down to the water's edge, twin yellow suns turning overhead. At last you've got the idea, Chiang said, but your control needs a little work. Jonathan was stunned. Where are we? Utterly unimpressed with the strange surroundings, the elder brushed the question aside. We're on some planet, obviously with a green sky and a double star for a sun. Jonathan made a scree of delight the first sound he had made since he left Earth. It works! Well, of course it works, John, said Chiang. It always works when you know what you're doing. Now, about your control. By the time they returned, it was dark. The other gulls looked at Jonathan with awe in their golden eyes, for they had seen him disappear from where he had been rooted for so long. He stood their congratulations for less than a minute. I'm the newcomer here. I'm just beginning. It is I who must learn from you. I wonder about that, John said Sullivan, standing near. You have less fear of learning than any gull I've seen in ten thousand years. The flock fell silent, and Jonathan fidgeted in embarrassment. We can start working with time, if you wish, Chiang said. Do you can fly the past and the future, and then you will be ready to begin the most difficult, the most powerful, the most fun of all. You will be ready to begin to fly up and know the meaning of kindness and love. A month went by, or something that felt about like a month, and Jonathan learned at a tremendous rate. He always had learned quickly from ordinary experience, and now, the special student of the Elder himself, he took in new ideas like a streamlined, feathered computer. But then the day came that Chiang vanished. He had been talking quietly with them all, exhorting them never to stop their learning and their practicing and their striving to understand more of the perfect and visible principle of all life. Then as he spoke, his feathers went brighter and brighter and at last turned so brilliant that no gull could look upon him. Jonathan, he said, and these were the last words that he spoke. Keep working on love. When they could see again, Chiang was gone. As the days went past, Jonathan found himself thinking time and again of the earth from which he had just come. If he had known there just a tenth, just a hundredth of what he knew here, how much more life would have meant. He stood on the sand, and fell to wondering if there was a gull back there who might be struggling to break out of his limits, to see the meaning of flight beyond a way of travel to get a breadcrumb from a rowboat. Perhaps there might even have been one made outcast for speaking his truth in the face of the flock. And the more Jonathan practiced his kindness lessons, the more he worked to know the nature of love, the more he wanted to go back to Earth. For in spite of his lonely past, Jonathan Siegel was born to be an instructor and his own way of demonstrating love was to give something of the truth that he had seen to a gull who asked only a chance to see the truth for himself. Sullivan, adept now at thought speed flight and helping the others to learn, was doubtful. 
John, you were outcast once. What do you think that any of the gulls in your old time would listen to you now? You know the proverb, and it's true. The gull sees farthest two flies the highest. Those gulls where you came from are standing on the ground, squawking and fighting amongst themselves. They're a thousand miles from heaven. And you say you want to show them heaven from where they stand? John, they can't see their own wingtips. Stay here. Help the new gulls here. The ones who are high enough to see what you have to tell them. He was quiet for a moment, and then he said, What if Chiang had gone back to his old worlds? Where would you have been today? The last point was the telling one, and Sullivan was right. The gull sees farthest who flies highest. Jonathan stayed and worked with the new birds coming in, who were all very bright and quick with their lessons. But the old feeling came back, and he couldn't help but think that there might be one or two gulls back on Earth who would be able to learn too. How much more would he have known by now if Chiang had come to him on the day when he was outcast? Sully, I must go back, he said at last. Your students are doing well. They can help you bring the newcomers along. Sullivan sighed, but he did not argue. I think I'll miss you, Jonathan, was all he said. Sully, for shame, Jonathan said in reproach. And don't be foolish. What are we trying to practice every day? If our friendship depends on things like space and time, then when we finally overcome space and time, we've destroyed our own brotherhood. But overcome space, and all we have left is here. Overcome time, and all we have left is now. And in the middle of here and now. Don't you think we might see each other once or twice? Sulligan Seagull laughed in spite of himself. You crazy bird, he said kindly. If anybody can show someone on the ground how to see a thousand miles, it will be Jonathan Livingston Seagull. He looked at the sand. Goodbye, John, my friend. Goodbye, Sully. We'll meet again. And with that, Jonathan held in thought an image of the great gull flocks on the shore of another time, and he knew with practiced ease that he was not bone and feather, but a perfect idea of freedom and flight, limited by nothing at all. Fletcher Lind Seagull was still quite young, but already he knew that no bird had ever been so harshly treated by any flock or with so much injustice. I don't care what they say, he thought fiercely, and his vision blurred as he flew out towards the far cliffs. There's so much more to flying than just flapping around from place to place. A, a mosquito does that. One little barrel roll around the Elder Gold just for fun and I'm outcast. Are they blind? Can't they see? Can't they think of the glory that it'll be when we really learn to fly? I don't care what they think. I'll show them what flying is. I'll be pure outlaw, if that's the way they want it, and I'll make them so sorry. The voice came inside his own head, and though it was very gentle, it startled him so much that he faltered and stumbled in the air. Don't be harsh on them, Fletcher Seagull. In casting you out, the other gulls have only hurt themselves. And one day they will know this, and one day they will see what you see. Forgive them, and help them to understand. An inch from his right wingtip flew the most brilliant white gull in all the world, gliding effortlessly along, not moving a feather, at what was very nearly Fletcher's top speed. There was a moment of chaos in the young bird. What's going on? Am I mad? Am I dead? What is this? Low and calm, the voice went on within his thought, demanding an answer. Fletcher Lind Seagull, do you want to fly? Yes, I want to fly! Fletcher Lind Seagull. Do you want to fly so much that you will forgive the flock and learn and go back to them one day and work to help them know? There was no lying to this magnificent, skillful being, no matter how proud or how hurt a bird Fletcher Seagull. I do, he said softly. Then Fletch, that bright creature, said to him, and the voice was very kind, Let's begin with level flight. Part 3 Jonathan circled slowly over the far cliffs, watching. This rough young Fletcher Gull was very nearly a perfect flight student. He was strong and light and quick in the air, but far and away more important, he had a blazing drive to learn to fly. Here he came this minute, a blurred gray shape roaring out of a dive, flashing 150 miles per hour past his instructor. He pulled abruptly into another try at a 16-point vertical slow roll, calling the points out loud. Eight. Nine, ten, see, Jonathan, I'm running out of airspeed, eleven, I want good sharp stops like yours, twelve, but I blast it, I just can't make thirteen, these last three points without fourteen.
e ah! Fletcher's whip stall at the top was all the worse for his rage and fury at falling. He fell backward, tumbled, slammed savagely into an inverted spin, and recovered at last, panting, a hundred feet below his instructor's level. You're wasting your time with me, Jonathan. I'm too dumb. I'm too stupid. I try and I try, but I'll never get it. Jonathan Siegel looked down at him and nodded. You'll never get it for sure, as long as you make that pull-up so hard. Fletcher, you lost 40 miles an hour in the entry. You have to be smooth. Firm, but smooth. Remember? He dropped down to the level of the younger gull. Let's try it together now, in formation, and pay attention to that pull-up. It's a smooth, easy entry. By the end of three months, Jonathan had six other students, outcasts all, yet curious about this strange new idea of flight for the joy of flying. Still, it was easier for them to practice high performance than it was to understand the reason behind it. Each of us is in truth an idea of the great goal, an unlimited idea of freedom, Jonathan would say in the evenings on the beach. And precision flying is a step toward expressing our real nature Everything that limits us, we have to put aside. That's why all this high-speed practice and low-speed and aerobatics. And his students would be asleep, exhausted from the day's flying. They liked the practice, because it was fast and exciting, and it fed a hunger for learning that grew with every lesson. But not one of them, not even Fletcher Lind Gull, had come to believe that the flight of ideas could possibly be as real as the flight of wind and feather. Your whole body, from wingtip to wingtip, Jonathan would say, other times, is nothing more than your thought itself, in a form you can see. Break the chains of your thought, and you break the chains of your body too. But no matter how he said it, it sounded like pleasant fiction, and they needed more to sleep. It was only a month later that Jonathan said the time had come to return to the flock. We're not ready, said Henry Calvin Gull. We're not welcome, we're outcast. We can't force ourselves to go where we're not welcome, can we? We're free to go where we wish and to be what we are, Jonathan answered. And he lifted from the sand and turned east toward the home grounds of the flock. There was a brief anguish amongst his students, for it is the law of the flock that an outcast never returns. And the law had not been broken once in ten thousand years. The law said stay. Jonathan said go, and by now he was a mile across the water. If they waited much longer, he would reach a hostile flock alone. Well, we don't have to obey the law if we're not a part of the flock, do we? Fletcher said, rather self-consciously. Besides, if there's a fight, we'll be a lot more help there than here. And so they flew in from the west that morning, eight of them in a double diamond formation, wingtips almost overlapping. They came across the flock's council beach at 135 miles per hour. Jonathan in the lead, Fletcher smoothly at his right wing, Henry Calvin struggling gamely at his left. Then the whole formation rolled slowly to the right as one bird, level to inverted to level, the wind whipping all over them. The squawks and grockles of everyday life in the flock were cut off as though the formation were a giant knife, and eight thousand gull eyes watched without a single blink. One by one, each of the eight birds pulled sharply upward into a full loop and flew all the way around to a dead slow stand-up landing on the sand. Then, as though this sort of thing happened every day, Jonathan Siegel began his critique of the flight. To begin with, he said with a wry smile, You were all a bit late on the join-up. It went like lightning through the flock. Those birds are outcast, and they have returned? And that, that can't happen. Fletcher's predictions of battle melted in the flock's confusion. Well, sure, okay. They're outcast, said some of the younger goals. But, hey, man, where did they learn to fly like that? It took almost an hour for the word of the elder to pass through the flock. Ignore them. The gull who speaks to an outcast is himself outcast. The gull who looks upon an outcast breaks the law of the flock. Gray-feathered backs were turned upon Jonathan from that moment onward, but he didn't appear to notice. He held his practice sessions directly over the council beach, and for the first time began pressing his students to the limit of their ability. Martin Gull, he shouted across the sky. You say you know low-speed flying. You know nothing till you prove it. Fly! So quiet little Martin William Siegel, startled to be caught under his instructor's fire, surprised himself and became a wizard of low speeds. In the lightest breeze, he could curve his feathers to lift himself without a single flap of wing from sand to cloud and down again. Likewise, 
Charles Roland Gull flew the great mountain wind to 24,000 feet, came down blue from the cold, thin air, amazed and happy, determined to go still higher tomorrow. Fletcher Seagull, who loved aerobatics like no one else, conquered his 16-point vertical slow roll, and the next day topped it off with a triple cartwheel, his feathers flashing white sunlight to a beach from which more than one furtive eye watched. Every hour, Jonathan was there at the side of each of his students, demonstrating, suggesting, pressuring, guiding. He flew with them through night and cloud and storm for the sport of it, while the flock huddled miserably on the ground. When the flying was done, the students relaxed on the sand, and in time, they listened more closely to Jonathan. He had some crazy ideas that they couldn't understand, but then he had some good ones that they could. Gradually in the night, another circle formed around the circle of students. A circle of curious gulls, listening in the darkness for hours on end, not wishing to see or be seen of one another, fading away before daybreak. It was a month after the return that the first gull of the flock crossed the line and asked to learn how to fly. In his asking, Terence Lowell Gull became a condemned bird, labeled outcast, and the eighth of Jonathan's students. The next night, from the flock came Kirk Maynard Gull, wobbling across the sand, dragging his left wing to collapse at Jonathan's feet. Help me, he said very quietly, speaking in the way that the dying speak. I want to fly more than anything else in the world. Come along, then, said Jonathan. Climb with me away from the ground, and we'll begin. You don't understand. My wing. I can't move my wing. Maynard Gull, you have the freedom to be yourself, your true self, here and now, and nothing can stand in your way. It is the law of the great Gull. The law that is. Are you saying I can fly? I say you are free. As simply and as quickly as that, Kirk Maynard Gull spread his wings effortlessly and lifted into the dark night air. The flock was roused from sleep by his cry, as loud as he could scream it from five hundred feet up. I can fly! Listen, I can fly! By sunrise, there were nearly a thousand birds standing outside the circle of students, looking curiously at Maynard. They didn't care whether they were seen or not, and they listened, trying to understand Jonathan Seagull. He spoke of very simple things, that it is right for a goal to fly, that freedom is the very nature of his being, that whatever stands against that freedom must be set aside, be it ritual or superstition or limitation in any form. Set aside, came a voice from the multitude, even if it be the law of the flock? The only true law is that which leads to freedom, Jonathan said. There is no other. How do you expect us to fly as you fly, came another voice. You are special and gifted and divine above other birds. Look at Fletcher, Lowell, Charles Rowland, Judy Lee. Are they also special and gifted and divine? No more than you are, no more than I am. The only difference, the very only one, is that they have begun to understand what they really are and have begun to practice it. His students, save Fletcher, shifted uneasily. They hadn't realized that this was what they were doing. The crowd grew larger every day, coming to question, to idolize, to scorn. They are saying in the flock that if you are not the son of the great goal himself, Fletcher told Jonathan one morning after advanced speed practice, then you are a thousand years ahead of your time. Jonathan sighed. The price of being misunderstood, he thought. They call you devil, or they call you God. What do you think, Fletch? Are we ahead of our time? A long silence. Well... This kind of flying has always been here to be learned by anybody who wanted to discover it. That's got nothing to do with time. We're ahead of the fashion, maybe. Ahead of the way that most gulls fly. That's something, Jonathan said, rolling to glide inverted for a while. That's not half as bad as being ahead of our time. It happened just a week later. Fletcher was demonstrating the elements of high-speed flying to a class of new students. He had just pulled out of his dive from 7,000 feet, a long gray streak, firing a few inches above the beach, when a young bird on its first flight glided directly into his path, calling for its mother. With a tenth of a second to avoid the youngster, Fletcher Lind Seagull snapped hard to the left at something over 200 miles per hour into a cliff of solid granite. It was, for him, as though the rock were a giant hard door into another world. A burst of fear and shock, and black as he hit, and then he was adrift in a strange, strange sky. Forgetting? Remembering? Forgetting? 
afraid and sad and sorry, terribly sorry. The voice came to him as it had in the first day that he had met Jonathan Livingston Siegel. The trick, Fletcher, is that we are trying to overcome our limitations in order, patiently. We don't tackle flying through rock until a little later in the program. Jonathan, also known as the son of the Great Gull, his instructor said dryly, what are you doing here? The cliff? Haven't I? Didn't, didn't I die? Oh, Fletch, come on, think. If you were talking to me now, then obviously you didn't die, did you? What you did manage to do was to change your level of consciousness rather abruptly. It's your choice now. You can stay here and learn on this level, which is quite a bit higher than the one you left, by the way. Or you can go back and keep working with the flock. The elders were hoping for some kind of disaster, but they're startled that you obliged them so well. I want to go back to the flock, of course. I've barely begun with the new group. Very well, Fletcher. Remember what we were saying about one's body being nothing more than thought itself? Fletcher shook his head and stretched his wings and opened his eyes at the base of the cliff, in the center of the whole flock assembled. There was a great clamor of squawks and screes from the crowd when he first moved. He lives! He that was dead lives! Touched him with a wingtip! Brought him to life! The son of the great gold! No, he denies it! He's a devil! Devil! Come to break the flock! There were four thousand gulls in the crowd, frightened at what had happened, and the cry, DEVIL, went through them like the wind of an ocean storm. Eyes glazed, beaks sharp, they closed in to destroy. Would you feel better if we left, Fletcher? asked Jonathan. I certainly wouldn't object too much if we did. Instantly they stood together a half mile away, and the flashing beaks of the mob closed on empty air. Why is it, Jonathan puzzled, that the hardest thing in the world is to convince a bird that he is free? and he can prove it for himself if he'd just spend a little time practicing. Why should that be so hard? Fletcher still blinked from the change of scene. What did you just do? How did we get here? You did say you wanted to be out of the mob, didn't you? Yes, but how did you... Like everything else, Fletcher. Practice. By morning, the flock had forgotten its insanity, but Fletcher had not. Jonathan, remember what you said a long time ago about loving the flock enough to return to it and help it learn? Sure. I don't understand how you managed to love a mob of birds that has just tried to kill you. Oh, Fletch, you don't love like that. You don't love hatred and evil, of course. You have to practice and see the real goal, the good in every one of them, and to help them see it in themselves. That's what I mean by love. It's fun when you get the knack of it. I remember a fierce young bird, for instance, Fletcher Lynde Seagull, his name. Just been made outcast, ready to fight the flock to the death, getting a start on building his own bitter hell out on the far cliffs. And here he is today, building his own heaven instead, and leading the whole flock in that direction. Fletcher turned to his instructor, and there was a moment of fright in his eye. Me leading? What do you mean, me leading? You're the instructor here. You couldn't leave. Couldn't I? Don't you think that there might be other flocks, other Fletchers, that need an instructor more than this one, that's on its way toward the light? Me? John, I'm, I'm just a plain seagull, and you're... The only son of the great gull, I suppose. <sighs> Jonathan sighed and looked out to sea. You don't need me any longer. You need to keep finding yourself a little more each day. That real, unlimited Fletcher Seagull, he's your instructor. You need to understand him and to practice him. A moment later, Jonathan's body wavered in the air, shimmering, and began to go transparent. Don't let them spread silly rumors about me or make me a god. Okay, Fletch, I'm a seagull. I like to fly, maybe. Jonathan! Poor Fletch, don't believe what your eyes are telling you. All they show is limitation. Look with your understanding. Find out what you already know, and you'll see the way to fly. The shimmering stopped. Jonathan Seagull had vanished into empty air. After a time, Fletcher Gull dragged himself into the sky and faced a brand new group of students eager for their first lesson. To begin with, he said heavily, you've got to understand that a seagull is an unlimited idea of freedom, an image of the great gull, and your whole body, from wingtip to wingtip, is nothing more than your thought itself. The young gulls looked at him quizzically. Uh, hey, man, they thought. This doesn't sound like a rule for a loop. Fletcher sighed and started over. Ah, uh, very well, he said and eyed them critically. Let's begin with level flight. 
and saying that he understood all at once, that his friend had quite honestly been no more divine than Fletcher himself. No limits, Jonathan, he thought. Well, then, the time's not distant when I'm going to appear out of thin air on your beach and show you a thing or two about flying. And though he tried to look properly severe for his students, Fletcher Siegel suddenly saw them all as they really were for just a moment. And he more than liked. He loved what it was he saw. No limits, Jonathan, he thought. And he smiled. His race to learn had begun. Part 4 For a few years after Jonathan Seagull vanished from the beaches of the flock, it was the strangest bunch of birds that had ever lived on Earth. Many of them had actually begun to understand the message he had brought, and it was as common to see a young gull flying upside down and practicing loops as it was to see an old one unwilling to open his eyes to the glory of flying, boring, straight, and level out to the fishing boats, hoping for a supper of soggy bread. Fletcher Lind Seagull and the other students of Jonathan spread their instructor's teachings of freedom and flight in long missionary journeys to every flock on the coastline. There were remarkable events in those days. Fletcher's own students, and students of their students, were flying with precision and a kind of joy that had never been seen before. Here and there were individual birds who flew aerobatics as they practiced better than Fletcher, sometimes better even than Jonathan himself had flown them. The learning curve of a highly motivated seagull goes on steeply off the top of any graph, and now and then there were students who overcame limits so perfectly that they disappeared, as Jonathan had, from the face of an earth too limited to contain them. It was a golden age for a while. Crowds of gulls elbowed in upon Fletcher to touch the one who had touched Jonathan Seagull, a bird they now considered divine. In vain did Fletcher insist that Jonathan had been a gull like them all, who had learned as they all could learn. They were after him constantly to hear Jonathan's exact words, his precise gestures, to find tiny details about him. The more they begged for trivia, the more uneasy grew Fletcher Gull. When once they had been interested in practicing the message, training and flying fast and free and glorious in the sky, now they began to slack away from difficult work and became ever so slightly wild-eyed over legends of Jonathan, as though he were the idol of a fan club. Gull Fletcher, they asked. Did the magnificent Jonathan say, we are in truth the ideas of the great gull, or was it, we are in fact the ideas of the great gull? Please, call me Fletcher, just Fletcher, Seagull, he would reply, appalled that they would use a term of reverence upon him. And what difference does it make which word he used? Both are correct. We are ideas of the great gull. But he knew they were not satisfied with his answer. They thought he had dodged their question. Gull Fletcher. When the divine gull Jonathan rose to fly, did he move one step toward the wind or two? Before he could correct the one question, another was fired. Gull Fletcher, did the sacred gull Jonathan have gray eyes or golden eyes? The questioner, a bird with gray eyes, was in anguish for one answer only. I don't know. Forget his eyes. He had purple eyes. How can that matter? What he came to tell us was that we can fly if we would just wake up and stop standing around on the beach talking about the color of somebody's eyes. Now watch, and I'll show you a pinwheel turn. But more than one goal, finding it wearying to practice something as difficult as a pinwheel, flew home musing, the great one had purple eyes. Not like my eyes. Not like the eyes of any goal that ever lived. The classes changed with years, from wide-soaring poems in flight to hushed talk about Jonathan before and after practice to long involved recitations on the sand about the Divine One, with no flying ever done by anybody. Fletcher and the other students of Jonathan were at turns puzzled and correctful and firm and furious at the change, but they were helpless to stop it. They were honored, and worse, revered, but they were no longer heard, and the birds who practiced flying were fewer and fewer. One by one, the original students passed away, leaving cold dead bodies behind them. The flock, seizing upon the bodies, held great tearful ceremonies over them, burying them under enormous cairns of pebbles, each pebble laid in place after a long, sorrowing sermon by a deadly, solemn bird. The cairns became shrines, and it was required ritual for every gull who wished oneness to drop a pebble and a doleful speech upon the cairn. No one knew what oneness was, but it was such a serious, deep thing that a gull could never ask without being thought a fool. Why, everybody knows what oneness is, and the prettier the pebble you drop on Gull Martin's tomb, the better your chance of getting in there. 
Fletcher passed away last of all. It happened during a long, lonely session of the purest and most beautiful flying he had ever done. His body vanished in the midst of a long, vertical slow roll, something he had practiced since he first met Jonathan Seagull. And when he vanished, he was not setting pebbles or meditating over slogans of oneness. He was lost in the perfection of his own flight. When Fletcher didn't show up on the beach in the next week, when he vanished without leaving a note, the flock was in brief consternation. But then they gathered together and thought and decided what must have happened. It was announced that Gull Fletcher had been seen, surrounded by the other seven first students, standing on what would henceforth be known as the Rock of Oneness. And then the clouds had parted and the great Gull Jonathan Livingston Seagull himself, clad in royal plumes and golden shells, with a crown of precious pebbles upon his brow, pointing symbolically to the sky and sea and wind and earth, had called him up to the beach of oneness. And Fletcher had magically risen, surrounded by holy rays, and the clouds had closed again over the scene to a great chorus of Gull voices singing. And so the pile of pebbles on the rock of oneness, in sacred memory of Gull Fletcher, was the biggest pile of pebbles pebbles on any coastline anywhere on earth. Other piles were built everywhere in replica, and each Tuesday afternoon, the flock walked over to stand around the pebbles and hear the miracles of Jonathan Livingston Seagull and his gifted divine students. Nobody did any more flying than was absolutely necessary, and when it was necessary, they grew strange customs about it. As a kind of status symbol, the more affluent birds began carrying branches from trees in their beaks. The larger and heavier the branch a gull carried, the more attention he earned in the flock. The larger the branch, the more progressive a flyer he was considered. A few in gull society noticed that by carrying the weight and drag of the branches around with them, the most faithful seagulls became disturbing flyers. The symbol for Jonathan's teaching became a smooth pebble, then later any old rock would do. It was the worst possible symbol for a bird who had come to teach the joy of flight, but nobody seemed to notice, at least nobody who mattered in the flock. On Tuesdays, all flying stopped, and a listless crowd gathered to stand and hear the official flock student recite. In a matter of only a few years, the recitation stratified and hardened into granite dogma. great have a pity on we who are lower than send fleas on and on for hours come Tuesday. It was a mark of excellence for the official to run the sounds together rapid fire so they couldn't be recognized as words at all. A few insolent birds whispered that the sound meant nothing anyway, even if one could eventually figure out that there was in fact a word or two buried within it. Images of Jonathan, pecked from sandstone, set with great sad purple shell eyes, sprung up all along the coastline, at every cairn and replica cairn, centers to a worship heavier even than rocks could symbolize. In less than 200 years, nearly every element of Jonathan's teaching was taken out of daily practice by the simple pronouncement that it was holy, and beyond the aspiration of common goals, lower than sand fleas. In time, the rites and ceremonies that were planted around the name of Jonathan Seagull became obsessive. Any thinking goal altered course in the air, so as not to even fly in the sight of the cairns, built as they were on the ceremony and superstition of those who preferred excuses for failure instead of hard work and greatness. The thinking goals, paradoxically, closed their minds of the sound of certain words. Flight, cairn, great goal, Jonathan. On all other matters, they were the most lucid, honest birds since Jonathan himself. But at the mention of his name, or any of the other terms so badly mauled by the official local students, their minds snapped shut with the sound of trap doors closing. Because they were curious, they began experimenting with flight, though they never used that word. It's not flight, they'd assure themselves over and over again. It's just a way of finding what's true. So in rejecting the students, they became students themselves. In rejecting the name of Jonathan Seagull, they practiced the message he had brought to the flock. This was no noisy revolution. There was no shouting, no waving of banners, but individuals like Anthony Seagull, for instance, not fully grown into the feathers of adulthood, began asking questions. Now look, he had told his official local student, the birds who come to hear you every Tuesday come for three reasons, don't they? Because they think they're learning something, because they think they're putting another pebble on the cairn is going to make them holy, or because everybody else expects them to be there, right? And you have nothing to learn, my nestling? No, there's something to learn, but I don't know what it is. A million pebbles can't make me holy if I don't deserve it, and I don't really care what the other gulls think about me. And what is your answer, nestling? 
ever so slightly shaken by this heresy. How do you call the miracle of life? The great ghoul Jonathan Holy be his name said that flight... Life isn't a miracle, official. It's a bore. Your great goal, Jonathan, is a myth somebody made up a long time ago. A fairy tale that the weak believe because they can't stand to face the world as it is. Imagine a seagull who could fly 200 miles per hour. I've tried it, and the fastest I can go is 50, diving, and even then, I'm mostly out of control. There are laws of flight that cannot be broken, and if you don't think so, you go out there and try it. Do you honestly believe, truly now, that your great Jonathan Seagull flew 200 miles per hour? And faster, the official said in perfect blind faith, and taught others to do so. So goes your fairy tale. But when you can show me that you can fly that fast, official, then I'll begin listening to what you have to say. There was the key, and Anthony Seagull knew it the instant he said the words. He didn't have answers, but he knew that he would gratefully, gladly lay down his life to follow any bird who could demonstrate what he was talking about, show him just a few answers in life that worked that brought excellence and joy into everyday living. Until he found that bird, life would remain gray and bleak, illogical, without purpose. Every seagull would remain a coincidental collection of blood and feathers pointed toward oblivion. Anthony Seagull went his own way, as did more and more other young birds, rejecting the ritual and ceremony that encrusted the name of Jonathan Seagull, sad at the futility of life, but at least honest with themselves, brave enough to face the fact that it was futile. Then, one afternoon, Anthony was flapping along above the sea, thinking blankly that life is pointless, and since pointless is by definition meaningless, then the only proper act is to dive down into the ocean and drown. Better not to exist at all than to exist like a seaweed without meaning or joy. It all made sense. It was pure logic, and Anthony Seagull had all his life tried to abide by honesty and logic. He had to die sooner or later anyway, and he saw no reason to prolong the painful boredom of living. So he pushed over, from 2,000 feet, into a dive straight toward the water, coming down at nearly 50 miles per hour. It was oddly exhilarating to have made the decision at last. He had found the one answer that made any sense at all. Along about midway into his death dive, with the sea tilting and growing huge beneath him, there was a great whistling roar directly past his right wing, and he was passed in flight by another seagull, passed as though he had been standing on the beach. The other bird was a white streak, blazing down, a blurred meteor from space. Anthony startled, bent his wings into dive breaks, and wondered helplessly at the sight. The blur dwindled softly toward the sea, flashing down at the wave tops, and then bent into a hard pull-up, beak pointing right straight back up into the sky, and rolled. A long vertical slow roll, twisting off into an impossible full circle in the air. Anthony stalled, watching, forgot where he was, stalled again, I swear, he said out loud, I swear that was a seagull. He turned at once toward the other bird, who apparently hadn't noticed him. Hey, he called as loud as he could. Hey, wait up. The gull pitched immediately up on one wing, moving at tremendous speed, blazed back toward him. Anthony, in level flight, pulled hard into a vertical bank and stopped suddenly in the air as a racing skier stops at the end of a downhill run. <sighs> Hey! <sighs> Anthony was all out of breath. <sighs> what? What are you doing? It was a silly question, but he didn't know what else to say. I'm sorry if I startled you, the stranger said in a voice as clear and as friendly as the wind. I had you inside all the time. Just playing. I wouldn't have hit you. No! No, that's not it! Anthony was awake and alive for the first time in his life, inspired. What was that? Oh, some fun flying, I guess. A dive and a pull-up to a slow roll with a rolling loop off the top. Just messing around. If you really want to do it well, it takes a bit of practice. But it's a nice-looking thing, don't you think? It's... It's beautiful, is what it is. But you haven't been around the flock at all. Who are you, anyway? You can call me John. Last words. The last chapter is not an amazing story, though it feels like it. How do adventures suddenly appear in one's mind? Writers who love their work say that the mystery is a part of the magic. No explanation. Imagination is an old soul. 
Someone whispers in the spirit, speak softly of a bright world, and the creatures there with joys and sorrows and despairs and victories, the tale finished and beautiful except for the words. Writers swirl images to match the action they see, remember the dialogue from beginning to end, simply insert letters, periods and commas, and the story is ready to ski down the slopes of booksellers. Stories are wrought not with committees and grammar. They spring from a mystery that touches our own silent imagination. Questions hold us puzzled for years. Then a storm of answers comes sudden from the unknown, arrows from a bow we've never seen. So it was for me. When I stopped writing the fourth part, the story of Jonathan Siegel was done. I read the fourth part over and over again at the time. It would never be true. Would the seagulls who followed Jonathan's answers kill the spirit of flight with a ritual? That chapter said it could be. I didn't believe it. Three parts told the whole of it, I thought. Doesn't need a fourth. A desert sky, dusty words to smother joy, almost. It doesn't need to be printed. So why didn't I burn it? Don't know. I put it away. The last part of the book believed in itself when I didn't. It knew what I refused. The forces of rulers and rituals slowly, slowly will kill our freedom to live as we choose. All that time passed, half a century forgotten. Sabrina found the story not long ago, ragged and faded, squashed under useless business papers. Do you remember this? Remember what I said? No. I read some paragraphs. Oh. I remember it. Sort of. This was... Read it. A smile for the antique manuscript she'd found, which had touched her. The typewriter's letters were faded. The language was an echo of mine, though, way back then, a sense of what I was. It was not my writing. It was his writing, the kid from then. The manuscript ended and filled me with his warning and his hope. I knew what I was doing, he said. In your 21st century hemmed about with authority and ritual, it's strapped now to strangle freedom. Don't you see? It's planning to make your world safe, not free. He lived his story, last chance. My time's gone. Yours isn't. I thought about his voice again. The last chapter. Are we seagulls looking at the end of freedom in our world? Part 4, printed at last where it belongs, says maybe not. It was written when nobody knew the future. Now we do. Richard Bach, Spring 2013